Mark, it's really good to see you again and have a chance to dialogue with you about your understanding of the Bible in relation to Israel and the claims of Zionism. Um, so let's begin with a question about uh, the biblical promises, um, uh, particularly in Genesis, which seems to suggest that God was promising the land to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. How do you square that with the claims of the Palestinians today? Okay, yes, it's great to be with you too, Stephen. Um, and just as a quick preamble, so people who know the context that I'm coming from personally with these observations and, and these thoughts, um, I'm an American Jew. Um, I was born uh, in the same year as the establishment of the State of Israel. And uh, to, to say it in a brief way, um, I come to this as a modern Jew heartbroken uh, and horrified um, by what is happening uh, to my people and to our faith and to our understanding of the Bible and of what God wants from us um, because of um, modern Zionism. Um, I, as a Jew, uh, I understand the impulse behind Zionism um, down to my very bones. Um, but I believe that Zionism, political Zionism, the idea of establishing an ethnic national homeland for the Jewish people in historic Palestine is a, a, a catastrophic mistake, one which we will someday forgive ourselves for. Um, so that, that's the context that, that I'm coming from here. I was raised in a very potent combination of rabbinic Judaism and political Zionism. Uh, in my lifetime, uh, these have become completely merged. I think that that is a disaster for Judaism and a disaster not as well as a disaster for the Palestinian people and for the Jews living in Israel today. Uh, and so I believe that the questions that we're going to be talking about today are very, very important for Jews, for Christians, for all of, um, of humankind. So uh, can you ask that question again, please? Yeah, just about the biblical promise of the land from um, from Genesis, particularly where we we have claims that God was giving the land to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. How do you square that with Palestinian claims to the land today? Of course, and the biblical promises uh, in the Old Testament narrative are, of course, a huge problem hermeneutically, theologically, politically, spiritually uh, for Christians as well as um, as well as for Jews. Um, there's no question about it that those are the promises in the Old Testament narrative. Um, God does come to one man. Um, he makes a promise uh, to that one man and to his progeny and to the family and tribe and eventually nation that, that, that would come from him. Um, the promises are very clear. It is indeed the Abrahamic covenant. There's no way around it. It is a promise, a particularistic promise to one people, to one tribe, uh, and then to one nation uh, to take, to inherit this land, to eventually in the same biblical narrative, to take it by conquest, um, genocidal conquest, um, to, not, to not to put too fine a point to it. Um, and so it is a problem. Today, when that um, biblical narrative, that Old Testament promise, is being used as effectively a deed to a piece of territory. Um, and what has happened is that uh, the Christians have picked up on this as well, and it's become the basis for Christian Zionism. And... Um, I maintain, and we will talk about this, I maintain that that is a betrayal of the core, uh, one of the core messages and a foundational um, message that Jesus brought in his ministry about uh, doing away with the territoriality of, of uh, the, the, the divine relationship um, with humanity. So the short answer to your question is, that the biblical promise does not square with the Christian faith, 
And I would say also that, that we Jews need to move beyond it as well. Well, the, the promise has been, um, if you like, put on steroids by contemporary Zionists um, who regard the land as extending from the river of Egypt, whether it's the Nile or not, to the Euphrates. Um, and they try and justify this uh, this land from the, the river to the sea um, biblically. Do you find that consistent with the scriptures themselves? Look, Stephen, um, the question of where the boundaries are and where the particular borders are is not the important question. The principle, the whole principle of granting territory, wherever you draw those lines, it's what's important. I mean, if you take a look at at the uh, the maps, you know, pe people, Christian Zionists uh, have, and, and, and Jewish Zionists as well, have attempted to go back to the scriptures and based on what they make of the geographical boundaries that are indicated in the Old Testament, uh, draw maps. And the maps are all over the place. Some of them look a bit like Palestine today. Some of them go all the way to Baghdad and down to to, to, to the Sinai and into Egypt and, and uh, right up to the Nile. It doesn't matter. You know, this is a historical epic. It was uh, framed and redacted uh, by uh, a Judean king uh, in, the, in the 8th century. I mean, the Bible is a wonderful, important, spiritually breathtaking document, but it also is a historical national epic that had to do with the consolidation of power and the claim to land. So those boundaries all over the place. What, what, pay no attention to them. Um, the issue is, does God operate to grant land to a particular people? And even you go beyond that. Um, and when Jesus you know, stood before the temple and said, destroy this temple, when he spoke to the woman um, to the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, we're done with mountains. We're done with building a particular house to God on a particular piece of property. If God, if, if, if God is God, the creator of all of us, then no one people or group is chosen and no one particular piece of land is holy. The earth is the Lord's. Well, today we see the development of that biblical conviction within Zionism that the land has been given to them by God. It's, but they want the land without the people. And so we've seen a systematic um, uh, strategy, if you like, to depopulate the land of Palestinians and maximize the settlement of, uh, of Israeli Jews. And this clearly is resulting into a form of segregation, areas for Palestinians, areas for Israeli Jews, including the settlements on Palestinian land uh, taken since 67. How do you explain this or deconstruct it or challenge it from the scriptures, this notion of racism, of, of colonialism, which is implicit within Zionism today? Yes, and colonialism is a very important word that you've mentioned. In fact, um, in the movement uh, for the liberation of the Palestinian people, a movement which has been uh, undertaken by Palestinian civil society at large uh, and by the Palestinian churches in particular uh, through a remarkable uh, theological uh, document known as uh, now known as the Palestine Kairos document of 2009, um, it's important to reframe what is going on now in between the, the, the Jews and the Palestinians, uh, not as a conflict or as a struggle for land, um, but as uh, a settler colonial project on the part of the Zionism, the, the Zionists, which was framed back in the late 19th century and then was planned. Um, as an ethnic cleansing project in the early part of the century, and then was carried out with the opportunity provided by the 1948 war and then the 1967 war. 
So we have a settler colonial project. So we have a, a colonial project oppressing an indigenous population. Uh, Ilan Pape, the uh, Israeli historian who now lives not far from you uh, down the road in, uh, in uh, Oxford, uh, has used the word incremental genocide. Uh, and that's appropriate. So um, we have to we have to we have to call uh, call it what it is, and we have to oppose it as human beings, as Americans, as Brits, as Indians or South Africans, as Christians, Jews, Muslims, uh, Hindus, uh, what have you, um, secular human rights activists. We have to call it what it is and oppose it as we would oppose any human rights um, violation. Um, to use scripture to justify this project, which is a, a racist criminal project, is horrible. It's obscene. And it's heresy. Now, it's not the first time. I mean, the, the church uh, from the age of discovery, you know, from the 14th century, has been actively involved in colonialism. Uh, and racism and slaughter and murder. Um, uh, using using scripture as a justification for that. It's nothing new. Uh, my country, the United States, uh, was founded by people who brought the Bible and said, uh, God wants us to do this. He wants us to take the land for uh, for white Christians and to get rid of the indigenous savages right so it's nothing new we have to see that in this way today now the problem is that modern christians um western european christians but now it's spread basically to to you can see this throughout throughout the world you can see it in asia you can see it in africa you can see it in particularly in latin america um have grabbed onto it as you call it zionism on steroids um which is one expression of the most destructive reactionary racist impulses in the world today um, and are um, and, and are using the Bible in this way. It, uh, Zionism is not biblical. The idea which is touted by fundamentalist Christian Zionists that the the establishment of the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, is a sign of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people and that the end times are coming and that uh, the day after the last non-Jew is, is cleansed from Jerusalem, Jesus will appear the next day, you know, is absolutely not biblical. What the, the hermeneutical challenge before us is, as you framed in your first question, to deal with the fact that, in fact, if you go to the Old Testament, forget the old times, the end times nonsense. If you just go back to a straight, literal interpretation of the words of the Bible, yes, it says that the Jews get the land. That the, 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 the descendants not of Abraham, but of Jacob. Right? Never mind the Abrahamic stuff. We have to get leave the Muslims out of this. The descendants of Jacob, and by the way, modern Christians have jumped on that and said, well, we, we are inhabitants of the house of Israel. We are, we are part of Israel. So we get to participate in that, in that uh, inheritance. The Bible says that. It says the Jews get the land. So my appeal to Christians has been, please be unapologetically Christian. Yes, you bear a huge responsibility as Christians. A 2,000, 1,700-year-old responsibility for Jewish oppression and for Jewish suffering. Yes, that was bad. Anti-Semitism was bad. It is bad. It is real today. But it has nothing to do with the human rights violations of the modern state of Israel. That has to be opposed. And you need to unapologetically say, yes, Jesus of Nazareth, who in my opinion was the best Jew, came to his own context, which was the Roman occupation of Palestine, facilitated and implemented by the Jewish um, 
uh, uh, oligarchy by the, by the by the Jewish um, uh, church of the of the day, the the priests, the Jewish kings who were working for Rome, and and said, "This is wrong. This is not Torah. This is not Judaism. This is not what God wants." God, yes, yes, God came to Abraham. Yes, God made this covenant with our people. We are now moving to the next step, which, as the prophets pointed out, can have nothing to do with king. In fact, should have nothing to do with temple and a temple cult. Jesus took it the next step. The prophets weren't quite willing to go there. They wanted to reestablish the temple. And when Jesus talks to his disciples before Pentecost and says, go to Jerusalem and receive the power of the Holy Spirit, they still don't get it. They say, oh, you, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were talking about king and temple and borders and hegemony and boundaries and land. And Jesus said, just, just go. And the story of Pentecost makes it very, very clear what Jesus was saying. He was saying, when you, what happens is when they get the power, they fall to their ground, and they get up speaking all the languages of the world, and Jesus says, yes, that's the power. This is for everyone. Now, get the hell out of Jerusalem and go to the wide world and spread that good news. So we have one Bible. It does not end with Psalms and with Kings and with um, uh, the, the story of the return from exile which is where our, my Hebrew Bible ends. It ends with the return of the exiles from Babylonia to rebuild the temple. No, you need to pick up from the Gospels and from the Book of Acts and from Paul's letters, which is the establishment of something completely new that sweeps away that old framework of exceptionalist people, particular people, and a particular land. That's what needs to happen. Now, when you as a Christian do that, and you know this very well, Stephen, you are called the worst name you can be called, and it is wielded as a cudgel, as a tank against you, anti-Semite. And we're going to cancel you out, right? Now, you've picked up that cross, my friend, and I'm very grateful to you for doing that. My appeal, and many of my Christian friends, clergy, theologians, Gary Burge is another here in the United States, Don Wagner, they picked up that cross gladly and faithfully um, and said, you call me what you want, but I know what my faith tells me. And I know that if I'm to express my love for the Jewish people and for my Jewish friends, truly express my love to them, I will say to them, I'm with you here. You are sinning. You need to pull your, You need to dig yourselves out of that hole. I will give you all the support you need to do that. But I must put my own house in order. And I must call upon my church and my fellow Christians to stand up and say, just as we stand for oppressed people in the global south, we stand for oppressed people, for the oppressed Palestinians. Uh, the Palestinian Kairos document talks about resistance being the absolute duty of a Christian. And it is resistance with love as its logic. So this is about love for Jesus and love for humankind. It's not about love for the Jewish people, but if you want to make it about loving the Jewish people, it is not about cleansing our hands of our guilt, giving you a guilt offering and saying, take the land, never mind Jesus and what he said about that. It's about saying to you, let us stand together for humanity and for human rights with the Palestinian people and for all peoples who struggle for freedom against colonialism and racism. Let us stand together. So why do you feel Christian Zionism is so popular, particularly in the States? Why has it got such a, a hold over so many churches and Christians? Uh, a is it a simplistic question. understanding well, of scripture? Well, that Are they addicted to prophecy yeah, coming true? Simple. What is it? It's, it's heretical. It's not just simplistic. It's, it's heretical. It's wrong. It's non-biblical. Well, let's just look at let's just look at our context. You know, let's let, let's look at the UK and let's look at the United States. Now, the United States <clears throat> has been a great friend of Israel. We keep talking about that. You know, we share democratic values. We love Israel. That's because it's in our own settler colonial DNA. 
we understand what it means for Europeans to come and take the land away from brown people. We love that. We won't admit it, but we love that. It's in our and it's in our Christian and our hermeneutic DNA as well. We can, again, we came with the Bible, right? So, and I think it's true. It's true for for the Brits as well. Um, it's in our comfort zone to be with the Jews against the Palestinians. Um, and so I think that, that that's one reason. I also think to grow a bit more deeply into it, that Christians and the church, I mean, it's in the Christian and the church DNA as well to be allied with colonialism. When Christians embrace Zionism, whether it's fundamentalist Christian Zionism with all the end times dispensationalist stuff, or whether it's mainline, mainstream Christian Zionism, hiding in plain sight in any church, Church of England, Episcopal Church of the United States, Presbyterians, Lutherans, what, what have you. Whether it be that form of it, which says, well, because, you know, the Jews have suffered so much, we need to give it to them in Genesis 12 and all of that. Um, when you um, When you unpack that, when you get under the surface of that, you see that it's attractive to Christians because it allows Christians to hold on to their own exceptionalism. We are hitching a ride. You know, we're giving the Jews back their exceptionalism. We're giving them back the covenant and the promise because it's too uncomfortable to think that Jesus was coming with something new because that leads to the ovens of Auschwitz. Okay, that, that, that's, that's where that whole complex comes from. It's uncomfortable to claim that Christianity brought something new. But what it brought that was new was to say, we're finished with exceptionalism. We're finished with we, with us and them, and us as something special. Jesus made that clear. Who is my neighbor? It's the naked suffering man in the ditch and you need to deal with him. And he's a Samaritan. My God, he's from that other group. I mean, how much more clear could that be? That's the Gospels. That's Jesus. That's Christianity. The church completely turned its back on that. Completely turned its back on that. And then you have the Crusades, and you have anti-Semitism, and ultimately you have uh, the, the, the Nazi Holocaust. All of that happened. Yes. But we have to be, we, we, we have to be done with that. Um, in order for Christians to truly embrace that, they have to let go of their own sense of specialness, of a special relationship with God. People want that. That's human nature. Christian Zionism feeds on that. It's based on that. You can't get much more fundamental than that. That's what's wrong with Christian Zionism. Just like that's what's wrong with Jim Crow. Yeah. And, and, and with a whole colonial project uh, writ large. That's what's wrong with the neoliberal uh, curse that's taking over the world today and destroying our planet. So the beauty of, when we talk about Christian Zionism, we're not engaging in some uh, uh, exercise in theological discourse. We're talking about the fate of humanity. We're talking about Christian Zionism as one powerful expression of human nature that religion should be coming to deal with. So the devil can quote scripture, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. I know Buddhists will say the same thing about what, what, how Buddhism can be abused. Um, uh, all have to face the same challenge. Um, it's the same challenge that Martin Luther King Jr. faced. It's the same challenge that that uh, Gandhi faced. It's the same challenge that Dietrich Bonhoeffer faced. It's the same challenge that Stephen Sizer in the UK has faced and Don Wagner in the United States has faced. Will I be faithful to my conscience and to my faith? Or will I take the easy way and go with the principalities and powers. And you know what Paul had to say about that. So let us all put on our arm, the armor of God yeah, and fight Christian Zionism for what it represents.
Last question. You've raised the issue of anti-Semitism. Um, from your perspective, how do you respond to allegations made against you and others as well? Even, um, you know, the claim of anti-Semitism is used against Jews as well as Gentiles. Um, how do you, how do you handle that? How do you respond to it? Well, I mean, it's the biggest arrow in the quiver, isn't there it? Is there is anti-Semitism. There is racism. Well, anti-Semitism is real. And as a Jew, uh, when I see anti-Semitism being weaponized and abused, it makes it worries me quite a bit because if everything is anti-Semitic, then nothing is anti-Semitic. And you have uh, you've taken away uh, our, our power to fight real anti-Semitism. Now, you know, uh, and we now talk about anti-Semitism being weaponized. If you look at the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, it makes it fairly clear, uh, even though its author has disavowed that and he's horrified by how it's being abused, um, he should have known better uh, because there's a big part of that that basically equates um, criticism of Israel and, quote, singling out Jews uh, um, and Zionism um, as uh, anti-Semitic. Now, this goes back to the 70s when uh, the term the new anti-Semitism was coined by neoconservatives in the United States um, when criticism of Israel started to surface. And they said, oh, well, this is just those lefty communists who are trying to take away our uh, democracy and our American way of life. So don't, uh, you must reject any criticism of Israel as being yet another form of anti-Semitism. Now that argument has legs, and now that Israel is really on the ropes, now that the word apartheid is being used uh, to describe uh, this, the state of Israel today, and that's totally accurate, it fits the definition, the internationally recognized definition of apartheid, um, they're pulling out that big gun and they're, they are accusing anyone who talks about Israel as an apartheid state or criticizes the policies of the state of Israel uh, as being anti-Semitic. So I think, again, we need to be prepared for that. I spoke about this before. That's the name you'll be called. It's worse than being called a racist these days. Um, it's unavoidable. And I think that it's a good thing now that there is an open debate going on about the IHRA definition and about whether uh, criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Any fool knows that that's not true. So uh, the wise people among us must stand up and say, absolutely not true. And if somebody accuses you of being an anti-Semite, you, as you have done often and have been forced to do, um, have to stand up and say, not so, not so. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate your answers, uh, very informative and illuminating. You mentioned um, your work with uh, Kairos at the beginning, I think. You are director of Kairos USA? Yes. Um, Kairos USA And how can folks find out more about that? Well, one spoke in the, so I mentioned the 2009 Kairos Palestine document, Moment of Truth, the word of hope, pain, and love from the heart of Palestinian suffering. This was 2009. And um, since that time, a, a whole global network of organizations, some uh, calling themselves Kairos, some calling themselves Sabil or uh, other, uh, other brands, but there is a low, there is a global Kairos movement now uh, of churches and church organizations throughout the world that have written their own Kairos documents, like the Kairos USA document. Um, you, um, you Brits have um, written. Um, I shouldn't just say Brits because it's uh, it's the Irish and the Scots as well. Uh, but it's the UK uh, call to action. Uh, a Kairos document, which uh, was written in 2015 um, up on the island of Iona, which was a wonderful experience. Um, and um, 
This is a, one, a wonderful thing because it's uniting the church ecumenically uh, behind the call of the Palestinian Christians to basically do what the church is meant to do, which is to take a stand against, uh, against racism and against injustice. Um, so uh, for all who are listening, if you're, if, if you're in the UK, uh, just Google um, call to action uh, the UK Kairos uh, document or go to Sabio Kairos UK, uh, go to Kairos USA uh, in the United States, go to Kairos South Africa, go to Kairos Brazil, go to Kairos um, um, Palestine. India and, um, and, 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 and find them. Uh, Australia has a wonderful group uh, happening. The Netherlands, Germany, France. Um, Kairos is, uh, in the South African document, it says it's a moment of opportunity when God uh, g gives a call to action. And so we are in a Kairos today, just as Jesus landed in the middle of a Kairos in the first century in Palestine. And... Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to take a stand and to follow the Palestinian people to work for all of humankind. Mark, thank you so much for being in dialogue with me. I look forward to having a conversation with you again soon. Thank you. You're welcome, Stephen. Thank you.